Welcome back to Exquisitely Aligned, where we know the answers are on the inside and we're all about that inside journey. Today, I am so excited to continue. I almost said finish, but I don't want this conversation to be finished, but continue things that had popped up or arisen while I was interviewing Pat last time. And we're able to go deeper into and whatever we don't finish today, I will definitely ask Pat if she has time to come back. But Pat Backley, welcome. Pat is an author born in England, but not happily settled. I'm sorry, born in England, but now let's try again. Pat is an author born in England, but now happily settled in Auckland, New Zealand passionate about people and travel. She has lived a colorful, which I'm going to agree to, an interesting, fascinating life, and her books reflect these passions. She published her first book just before her 70th birthday. And in the two years since, has written and published another six titles. She now intends to write till she dies. Welcome back, back, Pat. Thank you for being with me again. I had so much fun with you last time that I knew I needed to speak to you again. And every time I see your face, hear your voice and sit across from you, you really fill my cup. So I'm grateful to have you here today. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Gina. I'm just delighted to be here again. I just feel last time there were so many things we didn't talk about, but yes, you're right. I need you to come back just so for your audience, I apologize if I talk too much. <laughs> Never at all, because every piece of information, every time you speak, there's so much inspiration, there's so much um, knowledge in there. And for each person, I think, you know, there's a word or a phrase or a sentence or the entire paragraph that really strikes a chord. And that's what I love to be able to sit across from someone else who's lived on in different parts of the world than I. We have similarities and yet differences and can have such deep conversations. One of the things we had... Um, I don't even know if it was on camera or after we stopped filming, but you had mentioned about your wedding day for your first marriage. And it struck a chord with me because when I was 27, I got engaged to someone I loved very, very deeply, madly, so forth, and someone who I could see a bright future with. The problem was I had a hard time looking in the mirror as I wore his engagement ring. I couldn't look in the mirror because I felt in my heart of hearts that he didn't want to marry me. Oh. So you can imagine how difficult it was to get my red lipstick on without looking in the mirror <laughs> and washing my face at night when I'm trying to get the lipstick off, or, you know, from the side of my ear. But um, it got to a point where we were three months away from the wedding and I was getting ready. I had just sealed the last envelope, okay, and stamped and handwritten, da 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 stuffed all those envelopes uh, for the invitations. They were going out the next, it was a Sunday. They were going out the next morning, Monday. And on Monday, I was going with my mom shopping for her gown. And so I said to him, I'm a numbers girl. I said to him, what percentage are you sure you want to marry me? Well, he told me 80 and that was oh. the end of it. And so I, as a numbers girl, knowing that we were young, had very yeah. few bills, uh, were both healthy, parents healthy, no sick children. We had no children, no bratty teenagers, no temper tantrums from a toddler. Life was really good. So if he thought he was 80% sure on a great day, what would it be when we did have you know, uh, 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 something, something of seriousness? So I know you had mentioned about uh, something your dad said. So I was wondering if you could share that and then we can, um, you know, discuss how that went. Yes, of course. Well, I was a very naive 20 year old. 
just two day, two weeks after my 20th birthday. I'd mm. known him for a year. Um, he lived 50 miles away. Wow. I, I saw him once a week. I didn't know him at all, Gina. But in my <laughs> head, you know, I was so idealistic. I'd come from this poor but very loving family where nobody ever raised their voice. Everyone was nice to each other. I mean, we fought and argued, but everyone yeah, yeah. was basically nice to each other um so I had a very very rosy image of love and um I'd had a few boyfriends one that I was very fond of when I was 16 for 18 months but that that, we were too young but he was a sweetie um so I had no nothing to draw on then I met this guy who was a salesman my age but but full of charm he could have sold ice to the Eskimos and I was just I was just smitten anyway mom my mother the first time she met him didn't like him she oh. said to me words, he is not the right person for you and of course yeah. that pushed me into his arms further <laughs> well, well, it's it's funny because now as a mom I hear my mom saying like looking back it's yes. like oh yeah you know you you just have that motherly intuition you know your your child so well and you can see the other, the outside or the other person with such clarity, right? Absolutely. That, that, that was a tell, but yeah, go ahead. My dad didn't want me to get married either. Um, okay. He was a very quiet, kind man, didn't say very much, but he just kept saying, just think about it, love. Don't rush into it. Oh, well, I like that. At 19, you rush into everything, don't you? You know, <laughs> bear, in, bear in mind, this was in the 60s. So or was it the 60s? Just no, just the 1971. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a different time. Girls right. got married very young. You right. didn't, you didn't, you know, you, it, it was different. Um, so anyway, I collected all my bits for my wedding chest and all that stuff and got very excited, made a wedding dress. Mum did help me with that. Mm. And, and I paid for the wedding because my parents couldn't afford to. And also they didn't really want me to do it. Um, but I, <laughs> well, they were hoping it would it would backfire, right? Like, oh, exactly. well, she'll never be able to afford this, right? Exactly. exactly. Because I was under 21, they had to give their permission, um, oh, which they, I right. persuaded them to do, but they were very reluctant. Um, anyway, in the car, going to the church, it was just dad and I in the car. And he leant across, and my dad was the sweetest, loveliest man. He leant across, and he just gently touched me, and he said, "Love, we don't. You don't have to go through with it. We can ask the man to turn the car around and go home." Mm. I was stayed in that marriage for fourteen years, and there were times when I wished I'd listened to my dad's advice. But <laughs> I'm glad. I, I'm glad I did it because it made me the person I am today. All of the time. Sure. But yeah, and I never. Ever. I knew three days after the wedding that I'd made the worst mistake of my life. Well, so I wanted to ask you when he, when, okay, three days later, three days. that's yeah. very, very fast. But when he said it to you, did you have any, I don't know, did you, like, did any part of you think, yeah, we should turn around or not at all? I know. I I think I did. I think I was just, I'm very stubborn. You know, once I make a decision, I just go for it. Um, (laughs) These are all the things I love about you, Pat. (laughs) I remember before we left the house and I was just getting my wedding dress on and I was in the room and mum was doing whatever she was doing. And my godmother knocked at the bedroom door, can I come in and see the bride? And I said, no, 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 you can't. I was so <laughs> incredibly stressed. Yeah. And I think that kind of, in hindsight, I look back and I think, oh, my God, I knew it was a disaster. But I was kind of, I was kind of just going through it. Anyway, I, I have no regrets. But, yeah, three days later, yeah. we were on honeymoon in Paris. And it oh, all, wow. just, all just turned to custard, really. So, mm. Turn to custard. That's one I've not heard before. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to have to see if I can use that here in California. <laughs> it's, so funny. it's so funny because I use English expressions all the time. Yes. And often a lot of my Kiwi friends say to me, I don't know what that means. And a few, a few things in my books, people have said to me, what did that mean? They did they <laughs> no idea whereas to me it's just a normal part of my language you know? I know and, and I love it I just say you know yeah I, I, I 
always find it uh, fun to learn yes. new ways of, of expressing ourselves that, um, you know, but yeah, that's one I wrote down, wrote down, turn to custard. I'm going to make sure I see if I can work that in tonight, maybe tomorrow. See what yes. see. <laughs> I can't wait to see my husband's face when he's like, be quite fun. Would you pick that one up? <laughs> oh, my new, my new friend, Pat. Um, mm. So many times I've found working with women. I mean, I do work with some, I like to say very smart men, but I work with mostly women. Um, you know, marriages can be a wonderful thing. And mm. they are, uh, I want to say work. They take work. They take effort. Oh. Maybe is effort might be the, the better word. And intention. I think anything anything that you want something positive out of needs yeah. intention. And I found oftentimes women telling me, and this started years ago as I was a, 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 a newlywed, I watched women who were actually my age now, 54, and their kids were going out to college here in the United States or moved out, whatever the story. And I'd be so excited for them. Oh, wow, you're an empty nester. You know, I mean, I know it's it's bittersweet, right? But um, but I found it fascinating and sad when I realized many of them felt like their world was ending because they had given up so much of themselves into the marriage, the husband, and these one to 20 children, however many they had. It did. It wasn't like they had seven kids. It's, mm -hmm. Sometimes it was somebody who had one child. And I realized, like, how much did you give of yourself that now you have, like, I don't want to say nothing, but when I said, what, would, what do you want to do with your free time? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you enjoy? I don't know. Oh, and I just... So yeah, well, I it it was a mental Absolutely. note to myself, like never let that happen to you, Gina. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely, because you cannot go around depleted, yeah. um, you know, or not that you can't go around, but that you shouldn't have to. Yeah, there's yeah. got to be a way to balance. So, in that marriage that turned into custard three days <laughs> later in Paris, no less. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you had all these things going for you and there it turned right to custard instead of like a <laughs> thinking of a, a strawberry parfait or a chocolate croissant. Yeah. I don't know, but, or, or a champagne, maybe um, mm. something bubbly. Were there times in there that you felt like you gave, looking back, that you gave up parts of yourself or? Totally, absolutely, totally. I became a different person. I, wow. gave, I gave up all of myself, really. Yeah. Um, there were just little flashes where I kind of regrouped slightly. But no, no, I get, yeah, I, I threw everything into it. Interestingly, I never told my parents or my friends in 14 years that there were any problems. I just tried to wow. deal with it all myself because I, I'm, I'm very proud. And sure. I thought I have made this, I have made this decision. I've got to make it work. And I loved, well, I, thought I loved him. I think at that age, I'm not really sure if I really knew what love properly <laughs> was, but um, I grew to really love him. And and I just thought it was all down to me to make it work. I just yeah. thought if I keep trying harder, it would right. get better. And, and I think that's, a, that, let's let's stay there for a second. Trying harder, yeah. it would get better. I th yeah. think you, like, that's a huge one. They're just a simple phrase, trying harder, it'll get better. And I yeah. think that happens, you know, everywhere around the world. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, even though they may say it using different words, um, yeah. but it it happens so often, um, mm -hmm. and and not just in marriages, but in careers. So, f like, you know what I'm saying? Anything like, well, if I just keep working harder at something. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. as as you did that, how did you personally feel? Because I, I know how I would feel if I was there, but. 
Yeah. I mean, I think I was I was shocked, really, that okay. I'd got myself into this into this thing. He he outside the, and I've put it in my memoirs outside the Moulin Rouge. He I was I had a little camera, you know, the little Kodak cameras yeah. he used to have yes. back in the ages. And I was trying to take a photograph of the Moulin Rouge and the windmill. Yeah. And he said to me, you'll never get all that in the picture. I said, oh, it doesn't matter. It's just to say I was here. He just snatched my camera, threw it on the ground and started shaking me and shouting at me. Oh, in my the God. Street. And I'm going, I had, I mean, A, I had no idea that people behave like that because. On your were, honeymoon. Right. On your, on your honeymoon. In Paris. Is, yeah. And all of these Parisians are kind of looking. No one actually intervened, but I think they would have done if he got cross. And then in the end, he realized that people were watching. So he just picked up my broken camera and kind of dragged me off. Um, and I can remember going on home on the train. Um, yeah. after uh, We flew there and then we went home on the train because we were trying to save money. And I remember sitting on the train, looking at him, thinking, did it really happen? Did I just imagine right. it? Right. <laughs> There were a few. There were a few other things, like he was very rude to a waiter and stuff like that. But I can, I can still feel myself sitting on that train, thinking maybe I imagined it. Right. You know, I, I couldn't imagine that he'd turned into. But over the years, I mean, unfortunately, he did have a very violent temper, um, wow. and there were a lot of incidents. You know, the police yeah. were caught and stuff like that. So it was, yeah. And he had affairs. And he, having said that, we would have two children. Um, he then kept putting it off, putting it off and saying, oh, no, 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 I'm not ready. Wait another six months till my job's better. Um, mm -hmm. And when I was 27, I said, look, I need children. Please let me have children. No, no, I don't actually want children at all, he said. Um, wow. So I said, well, I'm going to go then. So I started packing my case. He said, no, 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 wait. He said, if you stay, we'll adopt a child. He said, but it will have to be at least five years old so you can carry on working in the business because I don't. <laughs> Set up a business, and I was so stupid. I was so stupid, Gina, that I kind of fell for it because I love children. It didn't matter to me yeah. whether it was black, white, ten, three, whatever. Um, and we went through the whole adoption procedure, you know, which is yeah. very rigorous. Um, I know because I've been through it. Yes, <laughs> yeah, of course you have. Yes, so right. you bear you your soul to all and sundry, don't you, and have your yes. Home and all that stuff anyway so we were we were accepted and for one year they kept offering us children and he would turn them all down there was something wrong with all of them wow. and I suddenly came to my senses and thought he actually doesn't want a child and yeah. the social worker came to their senses at the same time um yeah. and I, I left him two years later but it was hard it was hard because I'd invested so much and right. he, he was he was pretty violent. So he threatened all sorts of ghastly things if I tried to claim anything in the divorce. So I just walked away with nothing, just my clothes, my books, my paperweights. And that was about it, really. And just wow. started. Again. It was hard. Yeah, it, it is. And um, I just spoke with someone else uh, for a different episode and she was saying the same thing. She was actually uh, locked out of the house Mm. and slept on the beach in beautiful Hawaii. Yeah. And it should be such a, a wonderful thing, right? Hawaii is like paradise. Absolutely. And here she was, and she said she was fortunate enough, she was in her early 20s, fortunate enough to not have been scared back then. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I would have been sleeping with one eye open because yeah. you're out in the middle of the, you're out in the middle of, you know, any, you have nothing, you know, you, you don't have a door, you don't have a window, you don't have a roof, you don't have walls. You're, you're just, I, and, and let me tell you, I love the beach. I love yes. the beach, but I don't want to be sleeping on the beach at night mm. by myself. No, and, absolutely. um, she ended up staying with him for four more years, even though she knew she was ready to leave. And we talked about like, you know, how the, the mind can talk you in and out of things. And you mentioned the word you were shocked, you know, and okay. I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm just, yeah, I was shocked. Sorry. Carry mm -hmm. on. No, no. And it it happens. I think that, what came up in the conversation earlier uh, 
with her, Melvina, was that, you know, it's hard to tell someone else what the marriage looks like on the inside or how yeah. you're feeling or that you're putting up with something that shouldn't, or this yes. man who everybody thinks is fabulous is really not so the minute the door closes behind the company or, you know, the minute you get back to your car or whatever it is. And, um, you know, I was happy she said that because I think so many times we look and we say, why don't you just leave him? Or why don't yeah. you, there's so much that goes with it, right? So much. So much, so much, yeah. I mean, I I had to make, you have to wait until you're ready to go. Yes. The, the thing, two things prompted me to go. One was, um, well, no, one really, I think. Um, I had a, a very swollen thumb one day and it was enormous. It had swollen up to about six times the size. Wow. And I never, I never went to the doctor, but I, I had to go. And so I went and he was a big, big Indian chap, um, Dr. Mehta, an absolute sweetie. And he said, oh, I haven't seen you for about four years. How are you? I said, oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, he said, well, what can I do for you? I said, I've come about my thumb. So I kind of put my thumb out <laughs> to him like this. And he just... He just flicked it like that. And of course, I jumped because it hurt because it was full of poison. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, yeah, a bit of poison there. He said, now tell me what's really wrong with you. And I sat mm -hmm. in his office and cried for 20 minutes. Wow. And he said, so when you came to me, he said a few years ago with that back, he said, had he kicked you? I said, mm -hmm. yeah. He said, I thought so. He said, but I couldn't bring it up because you didn't bring it up. He said, can I tell you, Pat, that divorce is against my religion? He said, but you must leave this man now before he kills you. Yeah. And that, Gina, gave me the green light. It still took yeah. me two years to get the courage to walk away, but it gave me the green light. Somebody like that telling me it was okay, that it wasn't okay it's, what I was going through. Correct. You know? Yeah. And, it, and um, you know, I love that he could no without you even saying that you were oh. kicked yeah absolutely. absolutely and that he could sit you down this time and tell, say now what's yeah. really going on you know because yeah. I think it takes us somebody him or whomever to just sit somebody down one time and just say hey I'm here for you Yes, I get a feeling or I'm wondering, however you, the person said, uh, uh, yeah. because I'm intuitive for me, it's usually I have a feeling something's yeah. not right, or yeah. I have a feeling you're not telling me something, whether yeah. even if it's my daughter, you know, or my <laughs> husband. One time I said to him, I have a feeling you're like, are you cheating on me? Something you're, you're not telling me. And it was funny. He's like, no, my stepmother said something ugly about you. And it's been <laughs> on my mind for two weeks. I can't believe she oh. said, that. you know, and it was so ridiculous what she said that I wasn't caring for our son properly. Oh. Meanwhile, we had been on an international flight. The poor child was constipated. He was two years old. Oh. And she was telling him that I was a bad mother. And I was like, yeah, well, when you travel around the world uh, to see your grandparents who are living in France while you're living in the United States, sometimes a child's belly gets upset, you know? But I was like, oh, the, the mother-in-law mother thing, Gina, is a nightmare. It's a nightmare. I had the same. Um, when, when Lucy was born, my mother-in-law, my second yeah. husband, mother unfortunately was living in the house with us oh for wow four years it nearly killed me um and she was she she had no idea of boundaries so she would just walk <gasps> in the room when I was sitting there with my friends and and wow. anyway um but she was terribly super critical of how I brought Lucy up you know everything I did wrong um, wow yeah so I I understand the whole mother-in-law scenario <laughs> yeah just, just to go back to talking to people I didn't yeah. tell my so I was unhappy but of course they knew me well and after I'd left him mum said that every time I would go and visit them she would cry after I'd gone and say to my dad that girl's not happy what can we do mm -hmm. and they never spoke to me about it so in hindsight 
um, if they had spoken to me, I would probably have left a lot sooner. But, yeah. it, you know, you go, you do these things. It's all works out how it's meant to, I think. Yeah, it, it does. And I, I, I'm glad you shared that because that was going to be my next question. Like, how did you keep it from them? And did they, do you think they knew? So, yeah, I think if th- my kids are, are not uh, married, they're 17 and 21. And I believe I would be exactly like your mom. I mean, yeah. I probably, because you see how much I like to talk, I would probably be like knocking the door down or just blowing up their phones with, Hey, I think something's not right. But, um, but yeah. And I know a lot of people are like, well, it's their bed. They have to lay in it, or this is their marriage. They have to figure it out or, you know, but especially if somebody is overstepping their boundary and hurting another person, you know, whether it be physically, mentally, emotionally, physically, uh, you know, someone's spirit to breaking down someone's spirit. That's well, a problem. Yeah. Um, I, interestingly, when I left him, I yeah. had to make my plans very carefully because obviously I had to sure. establish a new life, find a job, a home, whatever, with no money, which was not <laughs> really. Um, yeah. But I, I told him three days before I left. I because I I said Richard I'm really sorry I can't do this anymore I have to leave I'm leaving on Saturday I've hired a van I'm just taking my few little bits and pieces and he laughed he said oh don't be ridiculous he said you'll never survive on your own he said you he said you've only ever lived with your parents and me he said you'll be back in three weeks (sighs) anyway I left and I told my parents and they were and my friends they were all very shocked and lots of them said we are so shocked. We thought you were the perfect couple. I said, no, I'm just Ooh. a good actor. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that would be mind boggling if they thought yeah. you were the perfect couple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, see, besides being an author, you can be an actress too. Oh, <laughs> in your free time. You. <laughs> you in your free time. Well, I love, the, I love, the, I love the fact that you share so you know, uh, transparently, each of these things that were, you know, that the the joys and the discomforts in your life. And I know you've written your memoir and or or more than is it more than one? I've written one memoir, one, yeah, and one travel guide, and then all my novels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So far to date, let's put that in front of (laughs) to date. And I know, um, I believe it was your memoir where you told me about uh, a gentleman and it might have been, um, I don't know if it was one of the first comments on Amazon, but I think you, I, I wrote it down and this was something I wanted to talk about. You had mentioned he wrote something to the effects of, even if it wasn't all true, it's yeah. a great story. And this is for those of you who weren't listening to that episode, uh, it, this was you sharing all your life stories yeah. and the good, the bad and, and the uncomfortable and the, the joyous. And and here he is, I think, thinking probably that how on earth can she have lived all of this already? You know, like <laughs> one person, one life. <laughs> so do um, do tell me, is did I get it almost right what he had written? You got it absolutely right, Gina. And when I read that review on Amazon, I just burst out laughing because I thought <laughs> that is so funny. Because to me, it's my life. I've lived it, I, you know. And it, and, it, and I look back now. Actually, I look back now sometimes, and I think, yeah. oh my god, how did I survive that? You know, there's there's been a lot, um, but yeah, it just made me laugh because I thought the people who know me well, when they read that. They said, oh, they, felt, they all my girlfriends were phoning me. They said, but you've left out all the really dark bits. You know, you've skimmed <laughs> over the dark bits. And I, when I read that review, I thought, if only you knew that, you know, there are so many more toe curling things I could have put in, but I didn't. Um, I tried to keep it quite lighthearted. You know, I put in lots of funny bits and not just, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Uh, well, I think sometimes it makes me wonder, like, why would somebody write that? Or are they just in, you know, disbelief? Is it that they live such a, 
I don't want to say small version of their life, but a, a more, uh, I think you used the word static the other day, static, because that that's a good versus, I think you and I experience all the ups and downs. I know we said in our conversation, we can go from here to there to there. You, you said like a butterfly, you could fly around. And I was like, oh, I like that. But um, what do you, when you heard that comment, what first came to your mind about who would write something like that? The other thing that I thought of was that maybe he just wanted a date with you to see, did she really look, can I see her photo album? You are fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it kind of had slightly that vibe to it. You know, it's a slightly kind of, wow, is this, can this really be true? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a horrible comment. It was kind of no. a, an almost, oh my God, really, has someone lived that, that much? Um, yeah, it was, it was, it just made me laugh. It just made me laugh and <laughs> made me, just made me want to reply, which of course I didn't because you should never reply to your reviews, but it made me want <laughs> kind of say actually yeah I could tell you heaps more if you like you know <laughs> stay tuned for the 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 yeah right. the darker version that my girlfriend's it, heard you know or uh yeah. the deeper the the I'll go in depth with each story yeah I love the fact that you've lived in more than one place um I have not left the United States but have bounced around between New York um, North Carolina and now here in my new home in California, which I still have to pinch myself every day to remind me that I live here. Um, it's our dream come true. But, you know, what I love about traveling and moving is I feel like it, it keeps us on edge to have those experience or to maybe be open or call in however you want to see it. I like to think both all those different life experiences like you're talking about what you know how would you explain that for yourself oh absolutely Gina I couldn't agree more I mean I got married as I've already said at 20 and he worked for a company and they had company houses so they gave us a house to live in um mm -hmm. and it, I made it my home I decorate I put beautiful Laura Ash not Laura um uh William Morris wallpaper up and oh my mm -hmm. god it was fabulous um <laughs> Four months later, four months later, he came home and he said, oh, they want us to move. Wow. I said, but, but I've just made this beautiful <laughs> home. And so we had to move like 30 miles to another of their rented properties. And again, I made another beautiful home. I did get to stay there for a year and a half. So that's good. good. And, and each time I worked in the bank, each time I had to ask for a transfer in the bank. Oh, of um, course. That was lucky because in those days it was much easier. So okay. I met lots of different people. And then from there, that was near London. And then we were sent up to Cambridgeshire to a little a little place called Ely, which is a lovely old ancient market town with a cathedral and whatever. Um, and, that, and we bought our first house there. So again, I threw myself into all that, had a fabulous time. Then about two years later, that was all done. We had to move back to... <laughs> South to the place of his birth, which is really where he wanted to be, which was a ghastly army garrison town. Okay. Um, you know, a bit grim. And But anyway, we bought another house. I made that my home. Um, <laughs> then we went to Fiji for two years, but that was a blessing and rented out the house and came back. And so I remade it my home. And then, I don't know, a few years later, I had to leave that. Um, so I've met so many different kinds of people just in the, yeah. those first few years. Um, obviously had two years in Fiji. It changed me entirely. The whole thing, the fact that I was miles, I mean, I didn't see my family for like three months sure. because I was yeah. so far away. And having gone as a little, I say 19, because I was really 19, 19 year old to this life and then suddenly be flung all over the country right. where I knew nobody had to keep starting again with my job. And, you know, I, I Friends. think I'm very yeah. lucky that I, that I just am able to adapt really. And that's been a theme all through my life. You know, I've, I think I worked out the other day, I've lived in 17 homes. Wow. Uh, which is quite a lot. Right. Uh, exactly. And you know, not not like next door. So I've never lived yeah. close to my family or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I just had to be very, very, very independent, really, which now has proved to be a huge blessing because I don't rely on anyone else. I, exactly. And that's what 
And that's what all the moving around has done for me. It's made me very resilient, really. Yeah, it does. And it, it, um, I think it opens us and it stretches us. It, you know, I, I like to say it keeps me on my toes. I, I, there is a beautiful mountain here and the name I'm forgetting, uh, I think it's Santiago, but anyway, it's my North, you know, it's my compass. So as I'm driving, if I get distracted by some of the beautiful flowers, trees, homes, anything, landscapes, then I look for my mountain. Oh, okay, good. I'm heading to it. I'm going home. I'm heading away from it. And not that we live at the mountain, but it's, you know, in the distance and I know how far I'm getting to and or or away from it is yeah. my but it really keeps me on my toes versus when you live someplace all your life and you just, you almost, I think I was on autopilot, you know, the, when I was new to Charlotte, I was, you know, eyes open, very aware. Then after living there for 10 years, 15, 20 years, it's like you're on autopilot, turn, stop. There's a stoplight. Okay. Make a left, you know, and then you're like, how did I get here? I think I dozed yes. off. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, I'm here. Wait, what did yeah. I do in between? I don't remember. Was there music going? Were the kids talking yes. in the back? Are the kids with me? You know, because yes. you're like, you're just on autopilot. And that's what I think I like about moving is that I find that, you know, you you really are have this awareness of what you're doing, where you are, meeting new people. You know, that's the other funny thing. So for me, it's sometimes awful. I forget, not sometimes, it's been a running theme in my life, forgetting people's names. Really? And I'll, I'll remember their face as yes. long as they don't cut their hair or put their hair in a hat. Oh. Um, you know, I have problems when someone's changed, especially if they dye the hair or cut it right. or it's super long and I met them with short hair. So um, this is a problem for me, but you know, when you're new somewhere, then you start again paying paying closer attention. Okay, what was that lady's name that I just met at Pilates? Okay, when I come back, I got to see if I can find her, remember her name, you know, whatever it is. I just think it really gives us like the, the, the man said, you know, as if it wasn't all true, but even if it was, it's a great, you know, even if it great wasn't story. a great story because she's done so much in so few years. And um, I, I love that and admire that about you and the ability for you to share those things mm. with everyone. Because like you were saying the other day when you were on the show about being, um, share our stories, you know, yeah. when, we, when we're gone, they're not here. For us. Our stories die with us. Yeah. Yeah. Unless we're like you, Pat, and have them in That's every right. bookstore <laughs> around the world, which is what I, I, I really, um, I love that. So I know that there was an unfortunate that we talked about some of the highlights in life and the, the low times in life and being shocked and um, dark moments. And I know you shared with me, uh, I think privately the other day after filming, one thing I wanted to talk to you about um, here live, if you're okay filming um, about your sister who is no longer walking this magical earth with us and how, you know, unfortunately for her, she wasn't able to get out of that darkness. Do you mind sharing uh, as much or as little as you can with us, because I know you found grace in that yes. and um, forgiveness. And I wondered if you could share, because I think this happens, uh, unfortunately, often. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Well, just to give a bit of background, she was my baby sister. I have two sisters and she was my baby sister. I was 12 when she was born. So I was kind of like a little mother to her. Of she course. Was very she was a very difficult baby. You know, she, she was quite temperamental, and um, but very sweet. Anyway, when she was in her late 20s, her husband, she got married very young, had two children. And then when she was in her late 20s, her husband left her for her best friend, which is, you know, oh. 
And she never, she never really got over it. She tried, she did date again for a little while, but she couldn't really cope. Luckily, my parents live nearby. So they kind of took over the children, more or less, yeah. while Martha was having all her dramas. And she ended up being sectioned a few times. And, you know, she was very, very troubled. Um, and... Yeah, oh, it was a horrendous time. And I've got very strong, very strong views about all of that, which I won't go into now. Um, so yeah, that but, but I mean, you know, um, the whole it, thing was ghastly, really. Yeah, um, a best friend and your husband. It's like two, yeah, it you know, just, your world. Was, yeah. And she didn't have she she didn't have the same coping mechanisms that I do. You know, I'm. Whether it's because she was the baby of the family and we all kind of mm -hmm. cossed her too much, I don't know. But she couldn't she couldn't ever come to terms with it. And she just deteriorated and te deteriorated. And then just we thought she was getting better. And um, just before her um fiftieth birthday, she just suddenly killed herself. Um she unfortunately hung herself and wasn't found for two days. So it was oh really ghastly um interestingly gina the day after she was found and i got i was in new zealand she was obviously in the uk so that was mm -hmm. even harder but the day afterwards i was all alone in the house and i i i i got i suddenly had her voice in my head and yes. she she said pat go and put it oh that's right i was in the bathroom and I'd just come out of the shower and I heard her voice and it wasn't scary. It was just Margaret's voice. And she said, go and put a necklace on. Now, mm. I have worn necklaces for 40 years. I kind of don't like the feel of them around my neck. Yes. And I always joke that in a past life, I must have been hung. <laughs> so of course, after my sister did this, you can imagine how that, that comment made me feel that I'd always been. Anyway, so there was my sister's voice. It was like seven in the morning saying to me, Pat, go and put a necklace on. So I went back into the bedroom, found a necklace, went went back, stood in front of the mirror with this necklace on. And her voice said, that's better. She said, that's my gift to you. I want you to be able to wear necklaces again. And then she was gone. Wow. It was the weirdest but very comforting feeling. Um, I yeah. still don't wear necklaces. Sorry, Margaret. Um, because yeah. I still don't like them around my neck. They irritate me. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was the most awful thing. And I think with suicide, it's so hard for everyone left behind. Oh, most definitely. Because you always, I mean, it's been 15 years now, but you always wonder if you could have done more. Right. You, know, you blame yourself. Um, it's the most dreadful thing. And worse, two years later, her son did exactly the same. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, it was just, yeah, I, I think my heart goes out to people who have suicide in their families or friends because it's something there you never have the answers to. Right. And, you know, it, it, there's always the questions and the, it's just ghastly. But I never, to my shame, I never quite understood why she got so low that she did it. And then when my husband, my second husband of 26 years, dumped me out of the blue, I obviously went through a pretty hard time. And yeah. at one point I was lying in bed and it was like three in the morning. It's dark. I'm alone. And, and you have all these dark thoughts going around. And I suddenly thought this is what it must have been like for her. Just this yeah. blackness that you can see no way out of. And right. And I suddenly felt I, I suddenly felt very guilty because I thought oh, I didn't really understand until this moment in time mm -hmm. how it how it can make you feel. You know, it's yeah. it's a tr it's a tragic thing, suicide. Yes, yeah. it it is on so many levels, and I love that you shared something that's so difficult to go through uh, the way you did, giving it a voice. And the fact that you could then see and understand where she was probably feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and your nephew also. Um, because I think that, um, you know, I think that happens sometimes where everybody is wondering, what, what did I miss? What could I have done? Did I, should I have, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda? Um, 
yet I don't know that it's always possible to change something like that. I don't, I, I, I'm not trained in that. I'm not versed in that. I don't have enough experience to, uh, to even imagine, no, but I'm guessing it's, no. It's very interesting, Gina, because three weeks before she died, she wrote me a letter and it was a three page letter. Um, and it was telling me how much, because at one point when she wasn't well, <laughs> I was painting her house and I was up a ladder and it was hot summer day. And when people have got emotional problems, they often like to be all closed in. They don't like windows open or anything. Oh. So it was steaming hot in her little house. I'm up oh, a ladder gosh. painting a wall. She's sitting on the sofa eating a donut <laughs> or something. And, she's, and she suddenly said to me, do you know, I've never really liked you very much. Oh, my God. <laughs> Did you want to dive off the ladder and then the road? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. But um, so fast forward a few years, and I got this letter from her three weeks before she died, and she said, "Oh, you've been a wonderful sister. I'm, I'm, I, I really appreciate everything you've done." For, and all these lovely things. And then she went on to tell me how happy she was, and you know, oh, she, wow. she met this man, and she was going to the theatre, and she was doing this and this. And I was ecstatic, Gina, because I felt she's turned a corner after all these years. Yeah. This is wonderful and then of course she died and a few weeks later I had a friend come to visit me who was a psychologist and I said now could I just show you this letter because I'm very confused you know I yeah. got this letter and then she died and she opened it and she read it and she said Pat that is absolutely classic she said before mm. people die they often write letters or talk to people they love and it's almost like they're just closing it off you know wow. and I I didn't know that. I had no idea. Well, that how that would you? Yeah. yeah. How would you? You would expect that's like, if I received a letter like that, I'd be cheering them on. This is great. I'm excited for you. I can't wait to meet yeah. him. You know, go enjoy the theater. Wow. I had no, um, yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. I, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sorry it happened, but I also know it's made you, um, or I believe, even though you're my new friend, um, it makes you live life more fully when you have an experience like that. Is Would that be fair to say? Oh, totally. I mean, I always brought, because my daughter was quite young when her auntie died, and I always said to her when she was going through those awful teenage years, which you're probably yeah. going through now, where everything's yes. a drama and <laughs> And and she used to have all these drums. And I used to say to her, darling, life is like that. Life will be throw you some horrible things. Right. And you have two choices. You either pick yourself up and carry on, or you do like Auntie Margaret did and give up. And I hated using my sister in that way. But in a way, it got the message through to, to Lucy right. and all her, her teenage girlfriends that that's what life is. It's a choice, really. Yeah. It um, is. And, and I understand, you know, when it's shocking or when you're in a shocking place like you were on, on your honeymoon uh, day three uh, after <laughs> being married, you know, with a broken camera and being shooken, uh, uh, you know, or when you're, you know, like you said, three o'clock in the morning, it's dark, you're alone and your husband has left. You know, there are those moments, but if we can be able to find a way to raise our hand and, and say, Hey, I need help or um, reach out, make a phone call, whatever, whatever that can be. So let's go to um, something that you mentioned about decorating a house and then the next and then the next and making them homes. I love that because, well, I'm here three years. I think it's this weekend, Labor Day weekend here in the United States. And, um, this room has already been painted twice. So <laughs> I, I very much, even though I'm in this house now, I will tell you the other rooms I have not repainted or have I, I don't think I have what, except for one, um, because I'm trying to behave, especially after hip replacement and shoulder replacement. <laughs> I, I, did, I painted all the walls in this house it, it, that were one story uh, by myself 
prior to hip replacement with a very right. unstable hip. <laughs> so I was bone on bone and didn't know it. So you should have seen oh. me climb the ladder. It was um, very yes. fascinating. My husband would be like, why are you doing this if you're in that much pain? Because it's COVID, we can't yes. do anything else. And this is my, I wanted to feel like my home, not the, the previous owners. So yep. um, I think you and I value being surrounded in things that make us feel like they come alive. How would you describe uh, your home? And I think your daughter gave you one of the greatest compliments, if you don't mind sharing it. Yes. No, it's, um, yeah, when I moved, I mean, I've always been passionate about about making homes, um, which is just as well as I've had so many. So it would be ghastly if I hadn't enjoyed it, wouldn't it? But <laughs> always loved it and before I move into a home I always know exactly where everything is going to go yeah. even so, down to the last yeah. tea towel I absolutely know there's no <laughs> before the documents are signed I know um so then I moved into the, the house I'm in now which is post-divorce so obviously all the big houses and the beach house and all that stuff's gone and I'm in this little house which is all I could afford and I, it was ghastly. It was, when I moved in, it was, all the walls were a very dark gray. There mm. was a dark green, horrible, dirty carpet. And <laughs> several of my, I'd shown nobody it until I'd moved in. And then several of my friends came to visit and they said, oh my God, Pat, what have you done? Why have you bought the house? I said, because <laughs> Listen, it's going to be beautiful. And I could see them all thinking, she's completely lost it. You know, this is <laughs> the edge. So I put all my I put all my stuff into storage for ten days. Wow. I, I came here smart. And ten days painting the whole house from top. That's to the, you know what I I should have contacted you before I bought yeah. this. Room. That's a great <laughs> idea because then you can move through the room so quickly without moving furniture, without worrying about splattering. Oh, I love Super. that idea. Super fast. And the other the other tip is you give yourself a deadline. Like I booked mm. the carpet fitters to come 10 days later because yeah. then I had to get it done. There was no <laughs> choice. But I did regret that decision because I didn't realize that to cover gray, dark gray walls took about four coats of white paint. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, 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 it was the height of summer. I was very stressed. It was only six months after my husband had dumped me. And I'm in this new house trying to do anyway. All that done, it was all done, and now five years on, it's beautiful, and it's just me. Everything I yeah. look at has got a story. I can tell you a story. Yeah. You could point to anything in my house, and I could tell you a story, because what I've done, I've obviously had to down um, uh, downsize hugely. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kept all the things that I love. And yes. I also went round my old house and I said to Lucy, she was in London at the time, so we had to do it all on Zoom. I said, tell me what you want to inherit and I will keep it because yeah. I've got to a lot of stuff. So everything that is in this house is very meaningful to me. Yeah. Um, and I, I think if you can make your surroundings something that actually means so much to you, yeah. then you relax and it just becomes part of you. So when Lucy came here for the first time, she was living in London, but she came back for Christmas and she walked in and she stood in the lounge entrance and she started laughing. I said, Lucy, why are you laughing? I was actually quite offended. <laughs> she said, she said, mum, it's like walking into your soul. Mm. And I just thought, oh, that means I've, I've achieved what I wanted. It's, it's my home. It's nothing to do with all the men in my past or right. anything. it's to do with my past, but it's my past as opposed to a past that's no longer with a man, you know? Yeah, and walking into your soul. I, yes. I, walking into your four words. I was going to say it was three, so I'm glad I counted it out. And I call myself the math woman. Maybe not anymore. <laughs> i got to give up that part of my title. But um, I love that so much, Pat, because I love beautiful things. And yes. I love things that speak to me, like you said, have a story. And I've had people in my house before and they look at me and go, everything has a story in your house. And I was like thinking, am I talking too much? Like, yes, yes, right. I not, 
should I have not told you why I bought this? You know, like you just kind of scratch your head and it happens so many times. You know, now I'm 54. Mark and I have owned, let's see, one, two, three, four. This is our fourth house together. I had a little condo before I met him. He had a place before a home before I had before he had me, before he met me. (laughs) I can't speak English anymore. But, um, you know, for me, I think it's so important to surround, like you were saying, things with meaning. I guess I never put two and two together. For me, it's things that are beautiful, that speak to me, that, you know, I I like collecting things when we're on, we're traveling. Um, You know, I have three pieces of black and white glass that we bought on a trip to California, oddly enough, when we were living in Charlotte and had no inkling that we would be living here. But it was a vacation that Mark and I were on and our son was in a stroller. You know, Mark's like, where are you going to put that? And I collect glass. I was like, oh, hold on. Hold on. I know where I'm going to put it. I'm going to move this to there and that to there. And that's going to now go, you know, because I learned very quickly. He's always going to ask, where are you going to put it? And so, so I learned to know where I would put, like you were saying, you would know before you moved in where everything was going. And in this house, I had ideas where everything was going, but the finishing touches didn't happen until I was here. And I think that was because we were, you know, back on the East coast and I couldn't really come back for another walkthrough to like, remember the house. So it was all, you know, on a sheet of paper, but, you know, for it to feel like it's walking into your soul. I feel like our homes represent us and are like you were saying, write our story, leave it for others to read, to enjoy even while we're alive. And then after we leave, but, um, I, th- I think that's why I like entertaining so much. I love having people to my house because they get to see more of me. Um, yes, do you, do you also right. like to entertain? I, I agree. I agree. Yes. Um, I'm very proud of my home. And I mean, I don't have valuable things because that's not my way. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't need all this fancy stuff. But I have. Well, I, I'm going to stop you there because I think yes. when something has meaning to you, that value is priceless. Totally. You I know? agree. So uh, you do have valuable things. I do have valuable things. <laughs> We're not going to give you an address for somebody to burglarize you. But yes, you do have value. You, yes. Yes, yeah. I do. <laughs> my, my things are incredibly precious and irreplaceable. Yes. Um, you know, that. I think that's the thing. I've got, I've got things that to other people, they probably think, oh, you know, what's that? But, but to me, they're very, very precious. But I do have, I do have reasonably good taste. So my house is like red and cream and you know all the bits that go with it and yeah yeah um so yeah I just love I just love my home and I love it when people come I love it when they just on the sofas and look around and say oh that's nice I didn't notice that last time and yeah that's what I want my home to be somewhere that people can just come and so I'm very particular about who I invite into my home yes I've I've realize that if you bring the wrong people in it can bring the wrong energy in oh and it doesn't feel good anymore yeah yes and i that's one of the things i love sharing i uh, i did a an entire season on the art of creating beauty and in the home in your schedule in your you know uh, I'm not even going to name them all, but I think you, you hit on another, I love entertaining. I just said that, but knowing who to bring in and who to not bring in and just maybe meet in public or somewhere else. It's very, very important. And if by chance you have an incident like on your honeymoon where you're in shock because you didn't think the 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 evening or the afternoon or the glass of wine or a cup of tea would go it a certain way and the energy shifts. Yeah. I always say a little white sage goes a long way, right? When you can burn, you know, or open the windows, or, you know, because I think sometimes we we don't know where something like Mark and I are not 
into politics. Mm. Uh, we really do, would not be sitting and discussing that at the dinner table, especially on a holiday. And it happened many years ago. Um, my ex-brother-in-law was very into politics and it, it just became one of those times here in the United States, which seems more common now than not. When I was a child, it wasn't like this. But nowadays it's gotten a little, in my opinion, out of hand. And I remember thinking, it's cold outside. How do I open the windows? You know, like we were running the heat. And but it was it was just yeah. like, oh, that wasn't the conversation I was hoping for at the Christmas at dinner after cooking for, you know, preparing meals or the, the meal for two days, you know, bits and pieces of okay, dessert, okay, appetizers. I can pre prep this to then go in the oven on that morning, la, la, la. And, um, but yeah, we really have to enjoy our home and, and, and not let it be a house, be a home and, and protect its vibe. And, and really, I love the fact that you said everything in your house has meaning and a story and, um, that's why I think I like you so much, Pat. I feel like I, I laugh about so many things like, oh my gosh, I'm like her too. I'm like her too. I'm like her too, you know? And um, I, it's, uh, it's just so fun to discover things that we share in common and, um, and things that we appreciate. But uh, I know I need to let you go. You have no, no, so I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> ages. I'm very happy. I know we, we may have to schedule an, another uh, another chat, but I'd love for you to share a few of the titles of your books, especially let's do the memoir first, because I know yes. some of we, what we spoke about is in there, if you don't mind sharing that. Yeah, no, no, I'm very happy to. Would you like me to show, it, show the book on yes, or just please. the book? Yes. Okay. So this is the book. It's called the Comment. From there to here with an awful lot in between. And that's the house I grew up in and the beach I ended up living on in Fiji. And on the back is this rather cute little girl. I don't know if you can see. Hang on. Yes, right. yes. Rather cute little school girl. That's obviously me. Um, and this is me as an adult with my Fijian, one of my Fijian family, who's enormous, who lived with me when he was a little boy. Um, and I just said, question, how did an ordinary girl from an ordinary home end up here? Answer through an awful lot of toil, trouble, and tribulation. So I kind of <laughs> sums it up, really. <laughs> I love it. And I, you know, one thing you mentioned the other day that I, do, I don't think we talked about here is that um, you write in the same manner in which you speak, which is so uh, enthusiastic with gusto, entertaining. And um, so if you haven't read any of Pat's books, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and, and just start, pick one and then go through all of them. Um, how about your travel one? Can you remind us the title of that? Yes. That one's called 70 Years Worth of Travel, Snippets from a Colorful and Interesting Life. And on the front cover, that's actually me. Yeah. Yes. The other end. Um, age 35. So I when it. I was in Fiji. Um, and that's just little snippets. It's very easy to read. Just little snippets of all my bits of travel. Um, yeah, that's... But as you say, Gina, people say that reading my books is exactly like having me sitting in the room talking to them. So I always laugh and say, if people enjoy the way I speak, they'll probably like my books. Absolutely. The they won't enjoy my books. So. Well, they're not listening anymore then. <laughs> But as always, I'd love to pull a card for you from the opening to possibilities yes. to journal prompts, contemplation and conversation starters. And I'm just going to do a quick shuffle. They've been shuffled before, but one more would be good. Um, so and Pat, you're so uh, full of life, full of sunshine. I absolutely adore sharing the the mic with you and um being in your presence even though it's around the world you're actually a day ahead of me and um that that's fascinating as well uh, and can be difficult when we schedule but we figured out a way around that didn't we because <laughs> i was like hold on 
and I can tell you what tomorrow is going to be like. Yes, be well, that's that's what my husband said. You should ask her what the weather would, will be tomorrow, <laughs> how everything in the world is. <laughs> if only you could give us the literal winning lottery number, we oh, would buy a ticket. So good. Oh, so, good. <laughs> so, okay, tell me, you tell me when to stop. Okay, stop now. Ooh, hang on. Advice. Oh, okay. as I'm going to flip it. Advice is abundant, even in unexpected places. How do you discern which advice to act on? The next question is, has someone else's advice changed your life? And what is your favorite piece of advice to give? Well... That's a big question. Well, certainly I would say several people have changed my life. Obviously all the, I was gonna say all the husbands I've had, I've only had two husbands, but I've lived with you guys as well. But it sounds much much more fun to say heaps of husbands. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, obviously they and all the people I've met through them um, have, yeah, I mean, I firmly believe Gina that everybody you meet in life is going to change you in some way. I really do believe that. Even if you just, you know, like I, I've got a very dear friend who I met when he was sleeping rough in London. Mm. And and we've become such close friends. In fact, when right. I was over in England a while ago, I said to him, do you know, Robert, I said, in another life, you and I could have been lovers. And we both burst out laughing. So much. <laughs> I came over to make sure we were all right. I mean, I have to, I have to say that he is very tall, very handsome, very black, um, yeah. and the most articulate man I I know. I think, um, and he was sleeping rough. So you know, you yeah. the one you meet, right? You know, you, yeah, it, it touches your life in a different way. Um, I've forgotten okay. what the other question was. Hang on, hang on. Bear with me. My fingers are slow. Um, what is your favorite favorite piece of advice to give? Give. Um, I would say, I would say probably whatever life throws at you, just try. In fact, I, I put it at the end of my memoirs. I'll, I'll quote yeah. it because here we go. Life can be tough, but try to keep smiling through your tears. When you get knocked down, get up and carry on. You never know what's around the next corner. Exactly. I Read that one more one more time slowly because it, it you always have like I mean and we're just looking at the back cover not even the inside. Yeah. This, okay, is, I'll this, is, this is the final the final sentence in my okay. memoirs. Life can be tough, but try to keep smiling through your tears. When you get knocked down, get up and carry on. You never know what's around the next corner. Yeah. And then I put the end and a girlfriend of mine phoned me and she said, I've just read your book. Should I hate that you put the end? I said, why? <laughs> she said, because it's not the end. You've got to carry on. You've got to. I just thought that was so happy. <laughs> well, it's true, right? It is true. I like that. See, that's the sign mm. of a good friend. Yes. Mm. Yes, yes, that's yes. definitely the sign of a good friend. I, I absolutely, absolutely love it. And I, I love what you're doing with your life. I love what you stand for. I love what you're sharing and how beautifully you say it. I don't know that you have um, audible books yet, but you have the, the way you read. You, you, Funnily enough, Gina, when I did, I was at a book thing, uh, an author thing the other day, and several people came up to me afterwards and said, you must do audible books. We love listening to you. And one guy said, he said, I just sat there with my eyes closed. I just read a few chapters from one of yeah. my books. He said, I just sat there with my eyes closed. He said, and it was wonderful. So exactly. It's just been, until this point in time, it's been finances that stopped me. But yeah. I'm determined that I'm going to do it because I, I want my books to be read as much. I mean, I'm not doing it for money, but I want my books no. to be widely read. Yes, um, absolutely. Obviously by, by doing Audible, it gets to more people. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, and I, as you can probably, well, you may not be able to tell, but as possibly you can tell, I do enjoy talking. So, yeah. so No, and you, you, you enjoy talking. 
uh, you're fun, you're lively, you know, um, and I, I can see closing your eyes and listening in and feeling it, you know? Um, and that's why I was like, I don't think she said she has audible copies yet. So that's I'm glad it. to hear other people are telling you the same thing and that you're yeah. ready to do it. That's, yeah. that is just fabulous because I understand, you know, getting the word out and um, being able to reach uh, the world over is how I like to say it is one of my things too. And, and that's kind of why I made the journal prompt card, not kind of, it is why I made the journal prompt cards because they're in a metal tin. They can be shipped anywhere and they, you know, are to be enjoyed, you know, be, after I'm gone. I tried to make the, the questions be uh, timeless and, and, and therefore, you know, somebody could ask the same question 50 years from now and it would, you know, work. We're not talking about... Uh, a hard drive or a certain microphone or a certain style of a haircut or something like that, that comes and goes. But thank you, Pat, for sharing this time with me, for being who you are, for going through all the trials and tribulations that life uh, brought, that you experienced through life and, you know, finding the sweetness in everything, even the hardest times, like being able to, um, is the right word, forgive your sister or, 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 um, understand, I think, understand, under, understand. Yeah, yeah, that's the word, yeah. understand yeah. it. And, 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 uh, I think when we can understand something like that, it's so enlightening and empowering and freeing is the word, yes. you know, that I would like to use. So thank you for all of that. You are just a, a ray of sunshine that always fills my cup and makes me uh, feel good the rest of the day. So for that, I am very grateful. I'm just thrilled to have talked to you again, Gina. In fact, now I think I need to do it every week. I'm sure we can yes. easily, easily <laughs> cover an hour's episode weekly just talking about <laughs> Using your fabulous prompt cards, which I love, um, <laughs> it's they're really sensible because it triggers things, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Such a great idea. Yeah, well, that's what it was meant for. I, mm -hmm. I've always loved connecting with people, yes. and uh, my husband and kids would always be like, "Oh, here we go. She met a stranger. We're going to be here for another forty minutes, an hour. Oh, she's waving to us. She wants us to meet them. Oh no, we're never going to make it to dinner." And they're always oh. The kids would be like, why do you talk to strangers? And I was like, I'm not talking to strangers. They're my new friends, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, I had to make journal prompt conversation starters, however you want to, because whether it's a conversation with yourself and your journal or uh, meeting somebody delightful around the world, I, I just... Uh, it really makes me smile. And yeah, we may have to do a weekly show together. That yeah, could be good. Let me sleep yeah. on it between your audible and this. We may, uh, we may have, be able to work it into the schedule, but I wanted to just uh, put it out there. Purpose Possibilities and Prosecco is still available. We've gotten some great press lately because of its high results. And it's only two hours private session with Sabine Kaiser and myself. Sabine is a brilliant and gifted, very knowledgeable, well-trained face reader in six different Chinese methods, both ancient and modern. And then you have me with 20 years of transformation ex experience. So uh, someone recently said to me, oh, is it a group I'd love to join? And I said, no, 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 it's so private. We like to keep it, the two of us and just one other person. Until next time, be exquisite. Thank you so much. Thank you.